38. Sovereignty and Dominion For fallen man, the problem with God is, first, that God alone is God, and beside him there is none other. This precludes man from becoming God, however much man may desire to be so. Second, God holds man accountable for all things, so that man always moves in a moral universe. The appeal of Freud, despite the manifest absurdities of many of his ideas, was that he provided an escape from moral responsibility to God. Blame could be passed on to one's parents and society. Gene Fowler cited an amusing analysis of this in his reminiscence of the 1920s. After complimenting Mr. Houghton for having on a Brooks Brothers No. 1 sack coat, Mr. Lucius Beebe, also educated at Yale and Harvard, but not Bowden, chanced to remark that most men blame their woes on others. The precedent for this despicable course, he went on to say, was established by Adam, the father of mankind, had maintained even to Jehovah himself that Eve had persuaded him he was not getting enough pectin in his diet. Mr. William Morris Houghton asked Leo, the bartender, for a glass of Prohibition Dew. He then made a somewhat shrewd observation. The basic cause of poor Adam's cynical behaviour lay in the fact that he had no childhood. He had been deprived of the fun of having his mother or, on the other hand, of a longing to return to the womb. The psychoanalysts are baffled by Adam's case history. They simply must come upon a cantankerous mother to bolster their findings, else throw in the sponge. This is a delightful summation of the matter. This evasion of responsibility has its counterpart within the church. I have many times been amazed at the hostility and even ferocity of those who deny the relevance of the law and insist that grace only is needed, not works. They insist that faith does not require works as its necessary concomitant, even as life in this world means breathing. Our Lord's words that every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and by their fruits ye shall know them, Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 to 20, are rejected. They seem to believe, as against Paul, that sinning will make grace abound, Romans chapter 6 verse 1. To evade responsibility and guilt by an antinomian manipulation of theology is simply another form of Adam's sin, even when it is called Bible-believing faith. God is the Lord. He is our sovereign. The Sumerian gods, like so many pagan deities, guided and controlled the world to keep it from falling into chaos. Chaos was ultimate and the gods were attempting to push back this ultimate darkness. Given this ultimacy of chaos, man's basic problem was not his own sin but the ultimate chaos and the frequent perversity of the gods. The cosmos was involved in the great struggle between cosmic order and chaos. Given this perspective, man saw himself as a victim of the cosmos and the gods. Not moral responsibility, but self-pity marked paganism. The God of Scripture tolerates no self-pity, not even when a man like Job suffers unjustly, because man is not the measure of his own experiences. Only God is the measure. Self-pity assumes that the purpose of creation is the happiness and satisfaction of the self an insane assumption. Hence, God demands of Job. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Job chapter 38, verses 2 to 4. In paganism, as in our present world of anti-Christianity, 
sovereignty is united to dominion in the same person or state, that is, in the dictatorship of the proletariat, in a dictator, or in a democratic state. In Scripture, God alone is the Lord or sovereign as our Lord. He requires us to be his vicegerents and to exercise dominion over the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Because God retains total sovereignty, it being an aspect of his being, and can never be sovereign, as one delegated to the exercise of dominion, man can only justly do so under God and in terms of God's sovereign law, which is an expression of his being. In its narrower limits, the image of God and man is knowledge, righteousness, holiness and dominion. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28, Colossians chapter 3 verse 10, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. Man can only possess the communicable attributes of God, and hence God's image in man gives dominion, not sovereignty. When man seeks dominion under God, he makes a purpose and goal of his life, the kingdom of God and God's righteousness or justice. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 When he seeks sovereignty and dominion outside of God, he makes himself and his will the centre of his life and of the universe. The same is true of the humanistic state. Its goal is defined by man, and because man is in revolt against God, the humanistic state steadily adapts itself to lawless and evil man. Because the humanistic state progressively becomes more depraved in its practices, abortion, euthanasia, a favourable attitude towards homosexuality, and so on, it becomes steadily more congenial to depraved men and more hostile to the godly. Thomas Boston said, The unrenewed will is wholly perverse in reference to man's chief and highest end. The natural man's chief end is not God, but himself. Most men are far from making God their chief end in their natural and civil actions, that in these matters God is not in all their thoughts. Their eating and drinking and such like natural actions are for themselves, their own pleasure or necessity without any higher end. Zechariah 7 6. Did ye not eat for yourselves? They seek God indeed, but not for himself, but for themselves. They seek him not at all, but for their own welfare. So their whole life is woven into one web of practical blasphemy, making God the means and self their end, yea, their chief end. Men are at war, said Boston, against their sovereign Lord. The indictment against them in heaven declares, 1. Thou art guilty of high treason and rebellion against the King of Heaven. The thought and wish of thy hearts, which he knows as well as the language of thy mouth, has been, no God. Psalm 14, 1. Thou hast rejected his government, blown the trumpet, and set up the standard of rebellion against him, being one of those that say, We will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19, 14. Thou hast driven against and quenched his spirit, practically disowned his laws proclaimed by his messengers, stopped thine ears at their voice, and sent them away mourning for thy pride. Thou hast conspired with his grand enemy the devil. Although thou art a servant of the king of glory, daily receiving his favours and living on his bounty, thou art holding a correspondence and hast contracted a friendship with his greatest enemy and art acting for him against thy lord. For the lusts of the devil ye will do. John 8, 44. 2. Thou art a murderer before the lord. Thou hast laid the stumbling block of thine iniquity before the blind world, and hast ruined the souls of others by thy sinful course. Though thou dost not see now, the time may come when thou shalt see the blood of thy relations, neighbours, acquaintances, and others upon thy head. Matthew chapter 18 verse 7
Woe unto the world because of offences. Woe to that man by whom the offence cometh. Yea, thou art a self-murderer before God. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 36 He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Boston becomes even more intensely passionate as he continues. He is hardly popular reading in a lukewarm church. It was, however, men with this kind of faithfulness and zeal who exercised dominion under God. They often made mistakes, indeed, but this is something the dead cannot do. One of the few good sentences in Hegel's writings is his maxim. A hero is never a hero to his valet, not because the hero is not a hero, but because the valet is a valet. The sins and mistakes of valets are rarely, if ever, noted by history, whereas those of great men are. It is the lukewarm whom our Lord despised. Dominion begins with submission to our sovereign and triune Lord. It means obedience to his law. It requires bringing every area of life and thought into obedience to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To depart from God's law is to deny the standard whereby a man's works can be assessed and his faith revealed. It is the evasion of responsibility and justice for a life outside of God. In another context, a non-Christian thinker very tellingly observed, Excellence indicts us, and it is perfectly natural within a democratic ethos that we should want to evade that indictment. Condescension establishes the distance that made evasion easy. This is another of the obstacles to participation. Non-participation maintains non-participation because the condescending attitude inherent in the role of spectator justifies the role itself. For Christians to withdraw to the sidelines is to deny the faith. Their calling is to be dominion men.